All right, welcome back. We're now excited to talk about the research that's been conducted at the Mailman Center over the last 50 years. There have been several amazing lines of research, research, I could say the word, that have been developed and implemented through the center. The beauty of much of the research that we complete at the Mailman Center is really, you know, that Venn diagram that Dr. Armstrong was showing earlier. That is how we do research. Our research encompasses training individuals on how to actually conduct research and partnering with the community to produce research that is built with and for the community. The following speakers that we have for this uh, storytelling are truly titans in their respective areas of specialty, both nationally and internationally. We are truly blessed to have such an amazing history of groundbreaking, groundbreaking research that has been conducted at the Mailman Center. First, we'll have uh, Dr. Delamater, who is a professor of pediatrics and psychology, and he is the director of clinical psychology and research. Then we'll have uh, Tiffany Field, who is professor of pediatrics, and Dr. Daniel Messinger, uh, who is also a professor of psychology and pediatrics. Dr. Delamater, you're all up. Well, thank you, Jason. Um, and it is really terrific to reflect on all the achievements and the history of the Mailman Center in terms of the training that we've done and the clinical services we deliver. And now we'll talk some about the research. And it's also terrific and great to see Mr. O here in the Mailman Center with Dr. Howell. It's chairs you've sat in for many hours over the many years that you've been here. So um, when we think about how can we begin to cover the research that's been done in these in this building and outside of this building over 50 years. It's really a daunting task. And really the best way to talk about it is to talk about the people who have who've done it. So I do want to mention, though, that there are a number of areas that our research has focused over these five decades plus two. Uh, we've clearly, it's been a focus on child development in high-risk infants. We've heard about genetic risk factors and fragile X, prematurity, low birth weight children, prenatal substance exposure, interventions to promote optimal development uh, through very innovative, inno, in, innovative means like massage as well as the early intervention programs. There's also been a big focus on speech development, particularly in kids with hearing loss. And of course, autism spectrum disorders has been a major focus as well. But our faculty has also focused on neurodevelopment in children with chronic health conditions, uh, in particular HIV, cancer, sickle cell, diabetes, and others, as well as psychosocial adjustment and regimen adherence in kids uh, with chronic health conditions. We've had a focus on obesity prevention, and we've had a focus on parenting interventions for behavior disorders. And as we've heard, and you've seen the Venn diagram, there's overlap. So much of our research is occurring with our trainees, much of our research is occurring in our, through our clinical services, and of course, much of it has been funded by NIH, by other federal agencies, as well as a number of other foundations. So I'm really fortunate to have two outstanding colleagues to help me today uh, in presenting this research, and the only way we really can do this is to talk about highlights and to focus on the individuals that have, have done this. So we're not going to cover everything, and this will not be a scientific presentation. It's going to really be covering the territory, telling the stories of who has conducted these type of studies. So first, I'd like uh, Dr. Tiffany Field to come up and talk about one of the things we've heard a lot about today, which is the early work uh, done by Herb Blubbs in genetics. Thanks, Tiffany. Thank you. I, I just wanted, before I start my uh, uh, long uh, <laughs> so, sort of review of older researchers, some of whom are no longer with us, um, I just wanted to congratulate everyone. I have never heard such wonderful presentations of clinical programs. And uh, having been here for 47 years, I think I, have, I couldn't begin to count the number of programs that have been developed. It's just so congratulations to all of you. I just wanted to say that. Uh, well, you've heard a little bit about Dr. Lubbs today. Um, he is no, noted mostly, if I can change the slide. 
Oh, okay. Uh, as you as you know, for the uh, marker, oops, X chromosome, fragile X chromosome. Uh, I happened to be invited to the award ceremony that uh, when Ted Kennedy gave him an award from the National Academy of the Advancement of Sciences. And uh, so I was there for that, and I, got, I had the distinct pleasure of sitting next to John John, JFK Jr., at that service, who went up and, and hugged Dr. Lubbs after Dr. Lubbs was given his award. So that was pretty sensational. I think it thinks my thumb is too cold or something. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the next person uh, you've all also already heard about, Dr. Aller. Um, Dr. Aller and his wife, Rebecca Eilers, uh, did a lot of work with, with uh, young kids who were deaf. You've heard about that already. And now you're gonna hear about some of the early research that they did on uh, babbling. The primary line of research that has uh, uh, been involved in my entire career uh, is work on human infant vocal development. I started doing that to some extent by accident at the University of Washington and then brought it with me to the Mailman Center when I when I moved there in uh, would have been 1975. I would have started in January of 1976. and. Um, the, there were a lot of really exciting things that occurred during that era, but perhaps the one that uh, yielded the most um, publicity and the most uh, reputation for me was the finding that deaf babies, babies born profoundly, bilaterally deaf, uh, uh, showed a, a series of very surprising characteristics. The first one was that they didn't fail to vocalize. They vocalized lots. As a matter of fact, we have no indication that they vocalize less than hearing infants do. And that's a story that we maybe will want to come back to. But there is something different. Uh, in the first year of life, deaf babies do not enter what we call the canonical stage of vocal development uh, until very late. Uh, the typically developing child starts producing baba da da na na, canonical babbling, uh, by the time they're around seven months of age usually, and essentially never after 10 months. And the deaf babies, the ones that are profoundly impaired, start essentially never that early. So uh, a, a, we, we discovered in uh, the 1980s, early 1980s uh, at the Mailman Center, that, um, that a, a deaf baby who was not producing canonical, or a baby who was not producing canonical babbling by 10 months was at very high risk for, for very profound hearing impairment. Um, it went on to other things as well, of course. They, 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 there are other risks that are associated with late onset canonical babbling, which was uh, an invention of our laboratory. Also, the, when I say an invention, we gave a name to canonical babbling and provided uh, a, a systematic acoustic and articulatory description of it. Um, and that uh, definition made it possible for us to notice that in a variety of circumstances, kids with neurological disorders, for example, might show late onset of canonical babbling. We know now that uh, that some babies, not all of them, but some with autism show late onset canonical babbling. And we've, uh, we've been continuing the work in autism. As a matter of fact, we have a paper in submission right now about that. So uh, our work in autism also started at the, at the Mailman Center. Mm -hmm. Moving on to Dr. Keith Scott. Uh, Keith and Mr. Honorati and uh, Dr. Stemple were very active in developing many of the programs that are in the Mailman Center. Uh, Keith and his wife, Marcia Scott, did a number of studies that uh, involved applied developmental psychology, 
an epidemiological approach to developmental disabilities, developmental risk factors, early intervention to promote child development in high-risk children. Moving on to Rebecca Puel, uh, she was very instrumental in a lot of the work that was done at the Debbie School, including uh, early intervention and longitudinal study of at-risk children and early language and communication skills in children. Moving on to some of the work that we did at the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, I wanted to acknowledge Maria hernandez Reef and Dr. Deborah Bendel for their uh, work with us on this. Uh, we massaged preterm babies um, in the beginning. Before we actually did the massages, we were working on uh, non-nutritive sucking. Uh, we argued that these babies were being tube fed and uh, they needed stimulation of the oral region, so we had them sucking on nipples and they gained a significant amount of weight. And the, then we argued that if they could gain that much weight from being stimulated just in the oral region, that if we stimulated them across their entire body, they might gain even more weight. And back then, uh, massage was not a very popular uh, therapies, so we called it tactile kinesthetic stimulation. And uh, eventually we came to call it massage therapy. We had to then do some studies to uh, document what the, um, the underlying mechanism was. And so we did a study that showed that vagal activity was increased when we massaged these babies. Uh, with the, the vagus is one of the largest cranial nerves, as you know, and has branches all over the body, including to the GI tract, where it stimulated gastric motility, and that was one of the mechanisms. And then we found that it also increased growth hormone. And uh, so we've continued to do those studies. Okay, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, uh, our next presenter is Dan, Daniel Messinger, and Daniel actually began his career as, uh, as a faculty member at the Mailman Center as a research assistant professor, I think it was 1994. And if my math is correct, given Daniel's experience and Tiffany's experience and my own, having started here in 91, I think that's around 106 years of combined experience doing research at Mailman. Daniel? Thanks, Alan. It's really a pleasure. Oh, look, it's me. Uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and to honor, I guess, our collective development as mailman faculty and intervention providers and really, as I look over the room, kind of honor the experiences we've been privileged to have, uh, both in providing care to and better understanding researching uh, these little kids. Okay, now I'll try the famous button. Whoa. I have to go back. And you know, it's a collaborative enterprise. It takes a lot of hand holding. Yeah, there you go. Start. Okay, so it's, um, it's a pleasure, an honor, and with a little bit of sadness um, to talk about Charlie Bauer, who we've heard a lot about uh, today, a neonatologist, a professor in PEDS, in OBGYN, but I think more than anything, really a mailman PI. Uh, really a presence who led the Infant Health and Development Program, IHDP. Um, in Charlie's work, he uh, really treasured uh, the importance of the, of the little ones, of the little babies in the nursery, and was dedicated to improving their lives through careful study of their development. Um, so through IHDP, he showed that intensive early intervention, both in the home and in the preschool environment, improved outcomes for babies, both at eight years, which you see on the slide, but uh, with this team throughout until 18 years of age. And then even uh, as much as early intervention, also policy. So um, Dr. Berkovitz, um, now the head of Early Steps, uh, working with Charlie to show that as medical science uh, channeled through mailman saved an increasing number 
of babies and babies of lower and lower birth weights, that their morbidity did not increase, that outcomes remained the same. So a good outcome for all. Uh, so I work with Charlie on um, maternal lifestyle study, and then I've continued um, to work collaboratively with uh, mailman folks uh, doing research at the Debbie School, the, the kids you've seen in the, in the slides and videos, um, looking at language and social development. So the maternal lifestyle study, uh, this was uh, the era of the quote unquote crack babies, but what we found in this big multi-site study is that there were subtle effects of cocaine exposure on cognitive and social emotional development, but they were no different in intensity or quality than the uh, effects of other prenatal exposures like alcohol and tobacco. Um, uh, this this uh, conclusion was also uh, bolstered by the work of Dr. Banstra, working with Dr. Dr. Connie Morrow, Dr. Iconero, and uh, Dr. Mansour. Um, so in their work, they found that um, prenatal cocaine exposure in particular had subtle but detectable effects on intrauterine growth patterns, on uh, language development, on attention measures, and also importantly on mother-child interactions. And I want to note that uh, Dr. Banstra and Dr. Morrow did this all through federally funded research based here in Miami. So they did not, they were not working with a multi-site study like we were. They were making it all happen here, all the way from the nursery to the follow-ups and to all the conceptualizations. So hats off to them. Uh, in, uh, in my own work with, uh, with Mama and colleagues at the Debbie School, we uh, track kids uh, in the classroom, so we see where they're moving. We record their vocalizations. We find that when Anthony talks to Maria, Maria will talk more to Anthony. So there's this peer effect of uh, talking with your friends. And we find that when our great Debbie School teachers talk in more complex ways, more, more phonemic diversity in their speech, the kids speak in more phonemically diverse utterances. Um, and this speech that the kids produce is linked to their assessed language ability. So the research takeaway is talk more in class. It helps your language and social development. And then it's a real pleasure to link uh, or to talk about the exceptional linkage of uh, mailman faculty with the card center. Uh, which is at the, more based at the Coral Gable campus. So this is the work of Michael Alessandri, top left. Um, Jennifer DeRocher, top right, also here. I'm, I'm sure Michael is with us online as well. Meg Parlotti, uh, bottom left, who was my graduate student, and uh, Dr. Hale. So on the bottom there, the same kinds of recordings of the kids that we did in the classrooms were also doing during their uh, autism spectrum disorder assessments that, uh, that Alan was talking about, and we find that there's a unique vocal signature of, uh, of kids with autism during those assessments. And I think finally, and, and very importantly, uh, the work of Jason uh, and, and Meg is uh, the belief was parent-child interaction therapy, okay, this is great, this can handle behavior disorders, but certainly it can't deal with kids with autism, they're so different but instead their research is showing, continues to show, um, that in fact PCIT can really help these kids and their families in our community as well. So thank you and I'll give it back to Alan. Thank you, Daniel. He's off to the airport, but we really appreciate him staying to talk about the people that have made this research possible at Mailman. And now I'm gonna continue our survey of these highlights, and a major focus over the years has been research led by Dr. Daniel Armstrong on the effects of chronic illness on neurodevelopment, and you will see this list of the research team, which includes many people who've been trainees, but who then have become faculty here at Mailman as well. Um, so neurodevelopment and chronic illness focused on mechanisms of disease as well as uh, effects of treatment on neurodevelopment. The uh, opportunity to link with the Children's Oncology Group was tremendous because it represented uh, nationally funded multi-site studies that made possible this very important work uh, that focused in various illness groups. And th 
the main thing about the impact of this was that it led to guidelines for care. And I think that's a really important uh, application of, of the research when it really does affect the ways that we um, conduct clinical care. Same thing with the, uh, in sickle cell disease, the multi-site national studies of the cooperative study of sickle cell disease, which focused on developmental functioning in, in toddlers and cognitive functioning in, in older kids as a function of uh, sickle cell dis disease and its treatment. Um, and then uh, studies continued with neurodevelopment in children with HIV, and you heard in the last presentation on clinical services the remarkable integrated program that was developed uh, for a developmental services project in HIV, which turned into a scholarly publication in peer-reviewed journal. Uh, one of the first of its kind at, uh, in the early, sometime in the 90s. Uh, my own work uh, has focused on psychosocial and behavioral research in children and, and adolescents with type 1 diabetes, and I've been fortunate also to work with a tremendous team of colleagues and students over the years. One of my colleagues uh, who's uh, really enjoyed working with and collaborating with over these years is Annette LaGreca in the psychology department. And together we had an NIH T32 research training grant health, that's focused on health behavior research in minority pediatric populations. I have to say that for me it was probably the most gratifying grant that I have ever had because it, it gave us the opportunity to work with so many people and help their career development. So this was really a rich collaboration between Melman and the psychology department that funded three pre-doctoral and three postdoctoral uh, pediatric psychology trainees for, for 15 years. One of the things that we did uh, at the time in 1992, many of you will remember when Hurricane Andrew uh, hit us in South Florida, so uh, Annette did a lot of studies of uh, kids' adjustment after the storm. I, I did actually a study as well on uh, the impact of post-traumatic stress on development, which documented that um, kids who were really stressed with, uh, with hurricane exposure and its aftermath had an increased risk for developmental delays. But our main work in diabetes is focused on pediatric health disparities, uh, as well as many factors that account for those disparities. And a number of studies that I did with my students, graduate students and postdocs over the years, has documented um, things like prescribed regimens, uh, disparities in prescribed regimens for intensive control in diabetes. I also had the opportunity to have multi-site nationally national studies funded by NIH uh, that was among the first to demonstrate internet-delivered treatment, psychosocial treatment, and improve outcomes in kids with diabetes. Um, another couple of collaborations, again NIH-funded, uh, focused on the transition from late childhood to early adolescence, and we were able to get uh, renewal funding to follow these kids till uh, uh, late adolescence and, and even early adulthood. Um, and um, another study was uh, reducing risk, risk factors for type 2 diabetes in Native American youth, which was a really, uh, a really high risk group for development of type 2 diabetes. And I think the real measure of research is its impact in terms of advocacy for um, clinical service delivery, and many of these uh, kinds of publications uh, really do result in position statements, consensus reports, and ultimately guidelines for clinical care. So having had the opportunity to participate in those kinds of publications really does, uh, I think, have, have the impact that we all would hope. Um, another opportunity for us was to look uh, at an ancillary study of the Hispanic Community Health Study which is a national multi-site NIH-funded um, study of 16,000 Hispanic adults. Dr. Schneiderman in, uh, in psychology was the lead PI for that entire project. But we were able to get an ancillary study to focus on the children of those uh, adults. And so that led to lots of studies to look at risk factors for cardiometabolic disease in young Hispanic children. One of my favorite colleagues and, and good friends is Lee Sanders, and you've heard Lee mentioned, his name mentioned a little earlier today because he was instrumental uh, in the Dyson projects that were seed funding for projects that ended up uh, sustaining over time 
Uh, and Lee was the uh, original uh, PI for Miami in a national NIH-funded uh, study of obesity prevention in the first two years of life where a low literacy behavioral intervention was delivered as part of well-child visits. And that study was published just a couple years ago in uh, the results of that in pediatrics. And it did show that that intervention reduces the risks for obesity through the first 18 months of life in, in young children. We are continuing to uh, evaluate uh, uh, the green light study with, with new kind of interventions, innovative interventions, which, which involve individually tailored text messaging to, to parents to try to even enhance those effects in green light. Uh, obesity prevention, uh, another innovative way to approach that has been the work by uh, Dr. Ruby Natale and Sarah Messiah here at Mailman that really focused on the child care setting as uh, an opportunity to change their environment and, and their policies to achieve uh, obesity prevention. And their work is exemplified by the Healthy Caregivers, Healthy Children uh, in a program that uh, was, has been published, and I'd like to show you actually just a, a brief clip of what that program looks like. And another example of the way that research gets done at Mailman is to evaluate the outcomes of our clinical services programs. And here are just two of those, the Jump Start program of Dr. Natalie's and, uh, and the Step Up AT, AT program that you heard Michelle Schladon talk about. Uh, now, Drs. Natalie and Gent have a new NIH grant to uh, look at the effects of a virtual mental health consultation in child care centers. And this was written during COVID, of course, but is going to continue post-COVID. And uh, we, we can't wait to hear the results of that in the next couple of years. And the PCIT 305 research team is same thing. They're, they're publishing papers on the effects of their programs. And uh, it's great to see that pocket PCIT is really getting disseminated. Telehealth has been uh, conducted during COVID and has been proven to be effective. Um, and now the PCIT team is really looking at com community-based services with natural helpers. And you can see the members of the, of the teams. I think everybody's here in, in the room actually today too. Here is one of uh, graduates of our program who is a great example of uh, continuing to collaborate with our faculty at Mailman. Maya Barnett. 
Mailman ended up being one of the most influential opportunities I've had to launch an independent research career. When I was there, even though clinical internship is often focusing on building up your clinical skills, I was able to be part of a research project that partnered with Connect Familias in Little Havana to train natural helpers to support families in enrolling and engaging in PCAT was able to stay engaged with the mailman team as we have evaluated this program over the years. Even more excitingly, I found that when I was on postdoc at the University of California, Los Angeles, studying implementation science, that I was able to use the data that I gathered at Mailman to write a early career award, a K award for NIMH, which I was awarded. And I had the wonderful opportunity to get to try to continue that work here in California, really trying to understand how natural helpers or other types of lay health workers can be an important workforce to address mental health disparities for children and families in marginalized communities. And I really see this as a cutting edge and important question that is being looked at from a policy level to a research level across the country right now. Maya was a terrific intern in our psychology program, and she went off to UC Santa Barbara, where she's now an associate professor. And even when people leave, they, they got to keep their ties to mailmen. So she's still collaborating with Jason and, and the PCIT team. Uh, and um, speaking of uh, more of our uh, uh, postdocs who, can, who can't seem to leave mailmen and love it here is uh, Lizzie Pogorom working with Dr. Lisa Gwynn and the, the School Health Initiative, and they were uh, able to secure NIH funding for the RADx program during COVID, and that has led to uh, more peer-reviewed publications uh, evaluating how schools manage COVID and um, uh, it, particularly in underserved populations. And um, I also want to mention the the work that continues here on in the medical at the Miller School uh, in collaboration with Mailman Center, the work of Yvette Sejas and Jen Koto, two former psychology interns actually of our program at Melman, who are now conducting really successful and interesting work uh, in the Department of Otolaryngology. So to summarize, uh, in terms of innovation, I think we have made substantial scientific contributions over five decades and counting that encompass various aspects of understanding child development, particularly in high-risk children, as well as innovative interventions to promote their optimal development. This has resulted in literally thousands of peer-reviewed publications, chapters, and books. I can only begin to highlight just a few. And also many millions of dollars of research funding that has supported this effort. In terms of connection, it's clear that there's been so much collaboration, and that's re really one of the key words, I think, that epitomizes our work at Mailman and what the culture of Mailman is collaborating with other researchers at the university, as well as nationwide through our efforts at multi-site studies to conduct cutting-edge high-impact science and impact research findings that lead to scientific association position statements, that lead to guidelines for clinical care, clinical practice, as well as for policy changes to sustain new evidence-based clinical programs. That's just a short kind of highlights. There's much more. And we look forward to continuing to conduct research here at Mailman. Thank you.